comenzamos. Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, tenemos algunos problemas con nuestro traductor. Eh, él va a intentar integrarse a esta presentación más adelante. Um, así es que, bueno, bienvenidos a este segundo seminario web sobre conservación de aves playeras y sistemas productivos. Yo soy Juanita Fonseca y soy especialista en conservación para la red hemisférica de reservas para aves playeras y también soy becaria del programa de soluciones costeras. Eh, me acompaña Salvadora Morales, que es especialista en conservación, y Vianey Ramírez, quien es especialista en comunicación y nos va a estar apoyando en esta sesión. Eh, este seminario web, web va a estar, eh, estar siendo transmitido vía Zoom y Facebook. Eh, es posible que cuente con traducción un poco más adelante. Eh, esta presentación será en inglés y al final, bueno, vamos a tratar de, de responder a, a las preguntas. Um, durante esta presentación ustedes pueden ir haciendo sus preguntas en la sección del chat o comentarios en Facebook y al final van a ser eh, respondidas. Si aún quedan preguntas o tienen algunas dudas, nuestro expositor se va a quedar a responder estas preguntas una vez que finalice la transmisión en vivo, en caso de que, de que haya algunas. Los invitamos a que mantengan su cámara y su micrófono apagado durante esta presentación. Y bueno, el objetivo de esta sesión de, de seminarios web. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Vianney Ramirez. So Juanita was telling everyone that we have been having problems, uh, problems with our translation. Uh, the translator uh, hasn't been able to connect because he's having some technical issues. So we uh, we are very sorry to don't pro to don't have the tool right now. We hope he will jump in at some point in the presentation. Um, we welcome everyone to the webinar. The presentation is going to be in English. Hopefully, David will speak slowly so we can all catch up. Um, we will try to cover as many things at the end on the questions and answer section. But if we are not able to finish on time, uh, our presentation agreed to stay a little bit longer here on the Zoom section to to answer all the questions and we will end the, the transmission through Facebook. So everyone is aware. If you have any question during the presentation, we ask you to put them on the chat section on this meeting. Thank you. Go ahead, Juanita. Thank you, Renee. El objetivo de esta sesión de seminarios web, la que llamamos conservación de aves playeras y sistemas productivos, es compartir conocimiento e información sobre el papel tan importante que puede desempeñar las granjas de camarón eh, en la conservación de las aves playeras en diversos países. Identificar beneficios también que compartimos entre, entre el desarrollo productivo y la conservación, así como promover buenas prácticas de manejo en el cultivo del camarón. Sabemos que las necesidades pueden ser distintas para cada país, sin embargo, el objetivo es el mismo, integrar a los productores y a los consumidores en estrategias y acciones de conservación para, el mejorar, para mejorar el hábitat para las aves playeras. Voy a pasarle la palabra a Salvadora para que nos presente a, este, a nuestro segundo invitado a esta sesión de charlas. Gracias nuevamente y disculpen los inconvenientes. Gracias, Juanita. Eh, bueno, me toca el, el honor de presentar a nuestro expositor en este segundo webinar. Y eh, David Nisraji hoy nos trae una presentación de lo más interesante que lleva el título Más allá de lo evidente, Camaronicultura y Aves Playera. El doctor David Nisraji obtuvo su doctorado en la Universidad de Clemson. Eh, la investigación de su tesis se centró en la ecología, fisiología y comportamiento del playero eh, menor y el semipalmeado durante los periodos de migración de primavera en la bahía de Delaware. Durante los últimos 20 años eh, ha ocupado el cargo de vicepresidente de, de investigación y monitoreo de Audubon de New Jersey y el área de espe especialización del doctor Misraji es la ecología y conservación de aves playeras con un enfoque principal en los playeros semipalmeados que actualmente se encuentran en peligro. 
eh, y otras especies de aves playeras que invernan en el norte de Sudamérica y migran a través de la región del Atlántico Occidental. Desde 1995 ha realizado una importante investigación sobre la ecología y el comportamiento de las aves playeras que utilizan hábitats de sedimentos blandos en Bahía de Lauer, incluido la investigación de la relación entre la disponibilidad de huevos de cangrejos de herradura y el potencial aumento de peso de los playeros semipalmeados, las relaciones entre el uso del hábitat y las estrategias de alimentación y fenología de la migración y conectividad mediante tecnología nanotech. En 2018, en 2008, inició un programa de investigación y conservación de aves playeras en el noreste de Sudamérica, con socios en Surinam, Guyana Francesa y Brasil. Esto incluye el trabajo sobre las relaciones espaciales entre las poblaciones invernales, migratorias y reproductoras, utilizando tecnologías de teledetección e isótopos estables. El uso de hábitat y el comportamiento de búsqueda de alimentos, la preparación fisiológica para la migración hacia el norte, los impactos de la acuicultura de camarón en el comportamiento de la búsqueda de alimento y la exposición a contaminantes. Y abordar además las actividades ilegales y no reguladas de caza de aves playeras en la región. Su investigación actual se esfuerza por desarrollar estimaciones aparentes de supervivencia invernal para los playeros semipalmeados en la región norte de Sudamérica y utilizar estos y otros datos similares de las áreas de reproducción y etapas de migración para desarrollar un modelo de red de, 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 red de migración donde se complete el, el ciclo de vida y que ayude a enfocar las estrategias de conservación para las aves playeras. Eh, voy a dejar a David Misraji que inicie la presentación. David, we hear you. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. First, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Salvadora and Juanita for inviting me to speak to everyone today. And thanks for, every, for all of you who are taking time out of your uh, busy schedules to listen to me tell a story about shrimp aquaculture and shorebirds uh, in Brazil. I, I'm gonna share my screen now. I see many familiar names. Um, and so thank you to all my friends, good to see you. And for those of you I don't know, I hope you uh, take away something important today uh, from my talk. And I'm hoping everybody can see my screen. I think uh, Salvador already gave you the title of my talk, and I want to start by thanking uh, my co-author uh, on the on this uh, talk and uh, co-collaborator on the project that we did in Brazil, uh, Jason Mobley from Aquasis. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, shrimp aquaculture in Brazil. I know many of you are working on shrimp aquaculture in Central America and, and maybe in the Northwest quadrant of South America. Um, but uh, the work that we've done has been in Brazil. I'm going to talk a little bit about the effects of aquaculture development on shorebird habitat in the, nor in the Northeast of Brazil. I'll give you a little overview of how chemicals used in shrimp aquaculture can degrade habitats, not only for shorebirds using shrimp, uh, shrimp ponds, but the ecosystems uh, surrounding the shrimp aquaculture facilities. I'll, I'll give you a lot of detail about the project that we did in Northeast Brazil with, with Aquasis, and then a little bit about some best management practices that we developed as part of the project. So for those who you who don't know, Brazil is the third largest producer of uh, farmed shrimp in the Western Hemisphere. And in 2013, they produced uh, 70,000 metric tons. Uh, that increased uh, to 90,000 metric tons in 2019. And they're projected to produce uh, uh, as much as 120,000 metric tons in 2021. Now, the area that produces the greatest amount of shrimp in Brazil is the Northeast region. That's the area on the map in, in the red circle. Um, and 98% of that production happens in just two states, Rio Grande do Norte and Sierra. 
And in 2009, that region produced $300 million in US dollars of shrimp on just 20,000 hectares of shrimp ponds. And, and the shrimp aquaculture in Brazil, like it does in many, many places that everyone is familiar with, it, the range is from small, uh, small scale operations run by families and co small cooperatives to large industrial scale operations. And, it, you know, in recent years, most of the shrimp uh, that's produced in Brazil is consumed domestically, primarily because of some issues they had uh, in the export market that have yet to be resolved. And I think we all know about the impacts of, of shrimp aquaculture on important habitats for shorebirds and for other uh, avifauna and other wildlife. And this is not different in Brazil than it is in any, other, any of the other places where people on this webinar are working or are familiar with. Mangroves are obviously an important habitat type that's impacted by, um, by shrimp aquaculture. Um, and they're, they're protected as, uh, in Brazil as they are in a lot of other places. And, and like a lot of other places, the conservation policies are not as strong as we'd like to see them. And the economic interests are an overwhelming pressure on, on a local state and federal governments to develop areas for aquaculture. Um, and I've, in, on this slide, I've separated mangroves and salt flats, although they're really part of the same system. Um, we know that mangrove uh, mangrove destruction was a major driver in, in uh, or uh, affected greatly by shrimp aquaculture development in Northeastern Brazil. But uh, an area that probably receives a lot less attention, although I know in speaking to colleagues who are on this call, people are acutely aware uh, of the importance of hypersaline salt flats or salgados um, that are under threat of development for shrimp aquaculture and other types of development. Um, and these are areas that are mostly often overlooked, but are critical habitats for roosting and foraging shorebirds and other water birds. And they're, they're a target for shrimp aquaculture development because they're often devoid of vegetation, which means a lot less investment in removing vegetation to develop the shrimp ponds. So back in 2010, uh, colleagues from, uh, from Aquasys did a study uh, looking at changes in habitat in Northeastern Brazil as a result of shrimp aquaculture. They did a study at, at 20 different sites in three states in Piauí, Ceará, and Rio Grande do Norte. And what they found is that in over a 20 year period, and they looked at the first period started in 1988, and then the second in 1998, and then the final period in 2008. So in that 20 year period, shrimp and salt pond areas increased by nearly 90% or almost double in that 20 year period with the largest increases occurring in the state of Rio Grande do Norte. And total shorebird habitat loss was almost equal to the, to the increase in shrimp and salt pond area during that same period. With a, a small amount of that represented by loss of mangrove or, or um, areas of mangrove uh, uh, inhabited by, ma uh, by trees and plants. And then a much greater proportion of that loss was in the areas of salt flats. And like I said before, salt flats are usually preferred for aquaculture development, at least in this region of, of Brazil. There's a lack of regulatory protection. So the, the only areas of mangrove I think that are protected are those that actually have mangrove vegetation on them, not the areas that are devoid of it, presentation, uh, vegetation. And there's overall a perceived lack of value. There's nothing growing there. We don't see it. We don't know anything about it. So why, could, why shouldn't we be able to develop it? Another source of, of uh, 
the degradation and habitat losses is through the use of, of, of many different kinds of chemicals uh, and enhancers to, um, to improve the viability of shrimp, uh, their longevity, their, their health and well being uh, prior to harvest. These include things like soil and water treatments, pesticides to remove competitors or, or predators on shrimp. Uh, water disinfectants, antibiotics to improve health, things to improve oxygenation of the water, and other, other uh, constituents to actually promote growth. Often these chemicals are over, over applied, um, uh, either because the instructions on these chemicals are not clear or the, the users are not following instructions carefully. This is a problem throughout, it's not exclusive to Brazil. And it's not only harmful to the consumer, so we don't, it's hard to know um, what, the, what the contamination levels are and how, in, in the harvested shrimp and how these might translate to the human populations that are consuming the shrimp, but it's also affecting the biota in, in the shrimp ponds, as well as neighboring ecosystems when effluents from these ponds are discharged. Um, and they, there's even some controversy and some disagreement about whether or not any of these enhancers and treatments uh, are effective in, in increasing production in a positive way. So, this was sort of the background I wanted to start with. So, and, and I think that all of us would agree that in the face of habitat loss in many areas that shorebirds are using throughout Central and South America, uh, having a, a habitat that, that can be provided through the, the appropriate management of shrimp ponds is, is an important uh, aspect that could be beneficial for shorebirds. I just wanted to um, sort of juxtapose or, or balance that discussion with what we, what we need to be aware of as shrimp aquaculture continues in these areas and, and further development uh, uh, increases at, in, into the future. So, uh, for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk uh, uh, about a project that we did with uh, our colleagues at Aquasis in northeastern Brazil, and we were really interested in quantifying how shorebirds use shrimp ponds, shrimp ponds, uh, and associated areas during migration and wintering periods. So this had not been done in Brazil, at least not to our knowledge, and we know colleagues of ours have been doing similar kinds of work in places like Honduras and Nicaragua and, and other places in Central America and Northwestern, excuse me, South America. Part of the work we wanted to do was quantify contaminant loads in shorebirds using shrimp ponds because of the reasons that I gave in the previous slide. And then I want, we wanted to develop a do document that would help guide shrimp farmers to, to reduce adverse effects of their uh, activities on migratory shorebirds. So here's our study area. Um, it occurred, we, our work occurred in the state of uh, Icapui, in, I mean, uh, in, near the city of Icapui in the state of Sierra, in an area of about 615 hectares of shrimp and salt ponds, which is within a protected area called the Manguezal da Baja Grande, and I apologize to my my Brazilian friends for butchering the pronunciation of all of that. Importantly though, this area is uh, adjacent to the Banco de Cajuai, which is a regionally important wizard site. And a lot of the discharge coming from these shrimp ponds are, are flowing out of the local estuary. I, you can see with my cursor and onto the Banco de Cajuai. Uh, the shrimp farms are, uh, that we worked on were operated by a uh, an association or a, um, uh, a collaboration of, of, of several shrimp farmers. 
Uh, and our focus was on Calidris pusilla and Calidris canutus, or semi palmated sandpipers and red knots. We did surveys uh, of eight ponds twice a year, twice a month for two years, and recorded all the shorebirds we, we uh, encountered. We did instantaneous behavioral sampling to assess the proportions of birds foraging or roosting on these sites. Uh, identified their habitat use. And then we collected blood samples uh, from red knots and semi-palmated sandpipers so that we could do assays for heavy metals and organic compounds. So now some data. So uh, I think that our colleagues from, from Aquasis already knew this. They didn't need to know to do these surveys to understand sort of the temporal patterns of shorebird use in the area, but this was specific to the areas of the shrimp and shrimp ponds in Ikapui. And so we can see that there are two distinct peaks, one in at least in the first year, one in October, and then again in February, which coincides with the southbound migration. And then again, the early stages of northbound migration, at least that's how I interpret it. Uh, in year two, it was uh, somewhat different with a more steady uh, increase of, of bird use uh, through December and January and then fading out before February. Um, the most abundant species we encountered were semi-palmated sandpiper, red knot, semi-palmated plover, and short-billed dowager. Here's just a quick list of the species. I don't want to go over this. Uh, but I just wanted to draw your attention to these numbers here. So this is a this is all the birds that we observed roosting and all the birds that we observed foraging. And you can see that they're relatively the same. But that's just part of the story. Uh, when we look uh, at the kinds of habitat that the birds were using and what they were doing. So in these graphs, you can see we have uh, bars that represent birds that we uh, uh, observed roosting uh, in the light blue and birds observed foraging in the dark blue. And you can see that most of the foraging took place in water and mud, uh, nobody's surprised by that. And that most of the uh, roosting occurred uh, on dikes or on drier areas, but also occurred in mud as shorebirds do in many other places. Um, when we took a closer look at the, the, the relative proportion of birds using uh, um, birds either roosting or foraging in the, in the shrimp farm, we saw a very distinct pattern. Red knots almost never forage in the shrimp ponds uh, and do most of their uh, roosting when they're on the shrimp ponds. In contrast, semi-palmated sandpiper and semi-palmated plovers are, are doing a lot of foraging on the shrimp ponds when they're there and, and also obviously roosting. And we, uh, of course, we saw a very distinct difference uh, between years, which we think might be related to different uh, water level patterns and shrimp harvest between the two years. So now I want to talk a little bit about the, the results from our contaminants exposure study. So we were only, uh, we, were, we never were able to catch enough red knots to, to have a sample size large enough to do this analysis. I think we only caught four red knots during the, entire, the two years of the study. So all the data I'm going uh, to um, show today are just, just about semi palmated sandpipers. So we screened blood samples. Uh, for several heavy metals, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, cobalt, lead, mercury, and selenium. And we collected about an equal, about an equal number of samples from, from one-year-old birds and from uh, two-year and, and older birds that we could age by plumage characteristics. So importantly, when you look at heavy metals, the, the, the key is, do any of these concentrations exceed the, what we call the effects level? And that is uh, a concentration that would impair the health of, of the bird or its behavior 
or any aspects of its annual cycle. So does it affect, you know, um, egg viability or chick survival during the nesting season? And we didn't find concentrations that were, uh, that exceeded those effect levels in anything but selenium. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And when we compared uh, these one-year-old birds or the birds uh, making their first trip to, the, to Brazil to winter versus birds that had done the trip at least once, we didn't really see any difference except in the concentrations of mercury. But even these concentrations were quite low, comparatively speaking, in terms of effect level. So I, people probably don't know a lot about selenium. Um, it, it's actually a, considered a metalloid and it, 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 at physiologic levels, it's actually a beneficial thing to have circulating in your bloodstream. It can reduce oxidative stress and in some cases can moderate effects of methylmercury, which is highly toxic. And so the interchain, the interplay between selenium and methylmercury is an important one for birds or animals that are exposed to methylmercury and it helps them to adjust and, and shed the methylmercury. But importantly, high levels of selenium can have adverse effects on egg viability and chick survival. Now, whether or not the birds can birds carry those the, those concentrations beyond the wintering period is unclear. But I have some data to suggest the possibility that they're able to shed some of that. So importantly, though, selenium levels in shorebirds are positively correlated with levels in the foods they consume. So uh, my colleague and co-author on the paper that's listed here um, found that selenium levels in uh, semi-palmated sandpipers in Delaware Bay was directly related to levels found in horseshoe crab eggs. And that's the primary food source for shorebirds when they uh, stage in Delaware Bay before reaching the breeding grounds. Selenium is used in aquaculture feeds to promote growth and increase immunity and disease resistance. And so it's not always listed on the, on the uh, bags of, of shrimp rations, but we know through uh, other sources that selenium, and I think there, we've posted a few papers on, on um, base camp to suggest that it's an important constituent in the feed used to, to uh, sustain shrimp. So what we did, we also compared data that we collected in Brazil with data we collected in, in certain at study sites in Suriname and in New Jersey and Delaware Bay. Uh, important to, to note that the site in Suriname and the site in New Jersey in Delaware Bay are not related to aquaculture at all. Um, and you can see that there are a couple of these uh, heavy metals that are, uh, have concentrations higher in Brazil than in other places, and similarly some that are higher in Suriname or in New Jersey. Again, I'll just draw the atten our your attention to selenium. It's an order, the concentration in selenium, selenium is an order of magnitude greater than either Suriname or New Jersey. So if there is an, a, a deleterious effect or a, a threshold of effect that could uh, 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 cause harm to birds at any stage, then it, then it could be happening in Brazil. And it's likely uh, a result of the, the prey that they're feeding on that are exposed to high levels of selenium as food, shrimp foods break down at the shrimp farm. Uh, we, unfortunately, there's not a lot known about the, the adverse effects of, of, Sorry about that. That's my alarm to say that I've run out of 20, my 20 minutes. Um, but uh, this is something that we're looking into in terms of what kind of effects arsenic may have. We know that arsenic is toxic. We just don't know. There's not a lot in the literature to know how, uh, what the thresholds are for adverse effects. 
uh, to birds. So just to quickly summarize, semi-palmated sandpipers were the most frequently encountered species at our study site. The, they had the greatest proportion of foraging individuals, while red knots had the smallest proportion. Clearly, exposure to heavy metal contaminants was evident from our data. Uh, and for some, concentrations were greater than in sites in Suriname and, U and the US. Uh, only selenium exceeded the effects level. And like I said uh, several times, likely related to the consumption of prey exposed to food rations used to feed shrimp. So I, I, I'm not gonna talk about this slide, but I just wanted to, I just wanted to um, sort of provide an, a, a quick overview of some of the things that, that happen at shrimp farms that are not only affecting shorebirds that use the shrimp ponds, but shorebirds that may be using habitats outside the shrimp ponds and ecosystems in, in close proximity. And so we should never lose sight of that. Obviously, shrimp, uh, shrimp aquaculture is, a, is a, a feature on our landscape and our coastal landscapes that will be very difficult to, to remedy. And so uh, the work that, that colleagues on this call have been doing to try, working with shrimp farmers to provide um, you know, useful habitat for shorebirds is an important one. We should always be considering what, what um, you know, what exposure sh uh, shorebirds have when they're using shrimp ponds and sort of the ecosystems in close proximity and what what damage may be done there. And and I'll I'll also mention that you know the conflicts with other resource users is is an important one. That is shrimp farms uh, that then prevent access by local communities to uh, traditional fishing areas and 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 harvest areas are an important one that we need to consider as we uh, advance this dialogue about shrimp aquaculture. And I, I'm not gonna say a lot about the best management recommendations. So that like I'm, I mentioned part of the project that was funded, uh, um, we proposed to develop a best, best practices document, which we did. Uh, it covered uh, several of these um, topics, uh, siting of, of aquaculture, pond preparation, food rations, additives to, to um, for these specific purposes, water quality and, and effluent discharge, sedimentation management, and then of course, things that could be done to enhance those habitats um, for shorebirds. I, I know I've spoken to some of you over the last couple of years to and promised that this would soon be available in Spanish, but this is much closer now than it was when I spoke to you. Um, thanks to Benoit La Liberté from Canadian Wildlife Service for providing a draft of the doc guidance document in Spanish and, uh, and Jason and his team for drafting the document in Portuguese. And we hope that that will we can use that to engage uh, shrimp farmers uh, throughout the the area of interest in Central and South America. So here's the people that I'd like to thank. I'm not going to read all these names off, but certainly want to thank the U.S. Fish and Wildlife for and Disney Conservation Fund for supporting the work that we've done. And um, I think with that, I can take questions. Um, you know where the contaminants are ingested by the ceases? I would guess, having then seen some other slides, you feel like the selenium is pretty much coming from the uh, shrimp farms. Well, th that's a really good question. Uh, we we can we can speculate, and obviously there are different sources for potential contaminants. So, for instance. Um, there's uh, a, a small fishing fleet uh, in Ikapui, and so the, the, the paints and solvents that are used to, uh, to protect boats could be um, 
le uh, leaching lead into the into the uh, ecosystem. There's um, we know that when you take um, areas that have not been inundated with water uh, for prolonged periods, and then you change that hydrology, that can release methyl mercury. So it it's related potentially to the shrimp aquaculture activity, but it, you know, so the question of, do we know the point source? We, we don't. And uh, we do know that, you know, in some, for some of these metals, um, the birds will, will shed that, that material, um, you know, during the annual cycle. So in a lot of situations, they're picking those those contaminants up in in the local area, but what the source is 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 uncertain. Gracias. Tenemos otra pregunta. Thank you. We have another question. Okay. Uh, aquí preguntan si las diferentes. If that differences populations represent different levels in different places of contaminants or can the birds cancel eliminate the heavy metals and if so how fast can they discharge the heavy metals Yo lo, yo lo. It could be exposure by of of first year birds um, that is different. So they may be using areas that are different than adult birds, and some some part of their time in at the study site. So um, so we don't know. Yeah, I, I I we see that a lot in in that uh, in situations where second year birds or or these. One-year-old birds tend to be exposed or have show higher concentrations of certain contaminants than than the adult birds. Just another quick question related to that. I was surprised at the different levels of contaminants between the Delaware Bay site, the Suriname site, and the Brazil site. Vamos a esperar si alguien tiene alguna otra pregunta. And so I put that back up on the screen. Yes, thank you. Uh, it just um, so I'm curious, does that represent different subpopulations and exposures or different um, rates of void, birds being able to avoid uh, contaminants? Or I um, but totally naive to this, so I'm just sort of curious. Well, um, so the, the birds that we sampled in Suriname were sampled during the same period of the annual cycle, so during the wintering period. So the exposures are different than, in, than they are in Brazil, and for different reasons. Um, there's a lot of, so, so in Suriname, there's, there's um, a, and a, a growing uh, gold mining uh, activity in the in some of the Amazon areas, and some of that some of that is causing mercury contamination as far as the coastline. Um, it's hard to know. Our, we have data on the connections between populations wintering in Brazil, Suriname, and Delaware Bay. That's a different talk altogether. 
but we know that a lot of the birds that are wintering in this region of, of northeastern South America, so we, what we call the northeastern quadrant, are passing through Delaware Bay in the spring. So it may be differences in their ability to avoid those, those contaminants during the period. It may be related to fattening and then burning that fat during migration. That's been something that Joanna Berger has, has talked about on, on several occasions. Okay. Tenemos una pregunta más. Eh, esta pregunta nos la hicieron llegar vía Facebook. Preguntan si las granjas de camarón son. If these shrimp farms are an ecological trap for the shorebirds. David, can you hear me? No me está escuchando David a mí. No te está escuchando. No. Did you hear yeah. Arturo? Can you hear Arturo? I can't hear Arturo at all. That's the problem. <laughs> okay. So I'm sorry. I, no, it's okay. I will read the question then. So Thank the you. question is from Facebook and is the shrimp farms are an ecological trap for shorebirds? That's the question is, yes. are shrimp farms an ecological exactly. trap for shorebirds? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think in some situations they can be. It, I think it, it depends on how, how much of a problem this is, these, the, the exposure to contaminants and what the ultimately is, is um, you know, the effect. Um, I, I don't think it has to be. So my, uh, I think that that there are uh, opportunities to speak with shrimp, uh, shrimp farmers um, and the industry at large to see how the, how the use of some of these chemicals can be reduced. I think these are, this is a this is a a single study at a single site in Brazil. I think these these this kind of study needs to be sort of more broadly. Uh, applied to understand if this is a pervasive problem or is it just one to a local area? I, I tend to think it's not a localized problem, but I think without without having done the work, it's it's hard for us to say. Um, and it it just it opens up the questions of what what we need to know. Um, I think there's been a lot of uh, really important work done in in Central America and in Mexico. Uh, on on shorebird use and the and uh, and uh, the air interaction with shrimp farms and this is just a sort of another facet, another element of our understanding. Tenemos otra. We have another question. Eh, pueden los, I'm going to read in Spanish because it's made in Spanish and then I will translate okay. for you, Okay, so you can start with Spanish. <laughs> sure. Eh, pueden los semipalmeides and piper presentar alguna normalidad física visible cuando son muy altos estos contaminantes? So the question, David, is, is if it's possible that CISA can show any physical evidence or, yeah, uh, when the contaminants are too high? Like, is there any physical or visible evidence on the species? The well, I think it's it more generally uh, animal birds that are exposed to to these contaminants do show symptoms of that exposure. So, I'll just talk about selenium. We know that there was there's there's at least one study that we're familiar with uh, that had that was focused on water birds on the Pacific coast, and I. Don't remember if it was in uh, the state of Washington or the state of, of Oregon or in Northern California, but there was an incredible, was extremely high exposure to selenium and the, the, the eggs of the nests of a couple of different species 
could have been loons or or gulls, but uh, I'd be happy to and to look and see the details. But uh, egg viability was was dramatically affected, and um, and chick growth and survival was affected. I think there there are um, you know the toxicity of mercury. I mean, it causes a kidney failure and and liver damage. We know that arsenic can cause nerve damage. It's just not clear what the threshold is. There, some of the uh, we know lead can cause brain damage um, in, in birds and mammals, and so there there are definitely symptoms. To I, I can't say that we've ever encountered symptoms in a bird that we were handling that suggested it was they were um, exposed to high levels of heavy metal contaminants. I think we have two more questions. So the next one says, David, great talk. Thanks so much for sharing. I'm curious about the site itself. It looked like one year there was a big spike in numbers in February. Do you think this site is being used for refueling on northward migration? Additionally, can you speak to how these contaminants might impact them at this specific site or throughout their migration? Yeah, so just a two-year study. So you have one year that shows you one thing, and the next year it shows you something else. And so you, you always wish you had a third year that might help you understand the situation better. Um, yeah, I think that that Jason Mobley would say that this is a site that's most important during migration, but evidenced by the the spike in numbers in October. Um, yeah, migration is is starting even in February in Brazil. I think the and I, I don't know that we know this. This is my own speculation, but I think these movements tend to be short, and so birds are moving from areas you know further south and coming through the the area of the Banco de Cajuai, traveling west along the Brazilian coast. They may end up in another major staging area in the state of Maranhão, which is an important, uh, hemispherically important wizard site. And then from there, potentially even further west into Venezuela before migrating north. Some birds we know are migrating north, you know, from Brazil, from French Guiana and from Suriname, you know, without moving further west to Venezuela. Of course, this is a time when birds may be accumulating um, energy resources and so if they're if they're um, hyperphagic so they're eating more than they would normally eat because they're preparing for migration this might increase their their exposure and the concentrations of these chemicals or heavy metals in their bloodstream again you know we're we're just sort of scratching the surface here and it's just a uh, you know because some of the some of these metals, we, there's not a clear understanding of their their at their their effect levels, um, especially in blood. Oftentimes, uh, uh, people studying con heavy metal contaminants are sacrificing the bird, and you, looking at the liver and other other organs to look at at contaminant levels. And so we we were using. Uh, a much less invasive technique. I don't know if that answered the question. Uh, so <laughs> I'm sorry if, if I didn't get to the get the right answer here. Okay, I hope it does. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we have another one in English that I will read for you, and I guess there is another more in Spanish, then I guess Salva will read that and I will translate. So it says, great presentation, David, thanks. Just wondering whether the contaminants level were different between males and females. My thought being that females could be offloading contaminants in their eggs. So. Good question, and I don't have an answer because I we did not sex the birds. They're very difficult to sex in the hand, so you have to do another test 
to do that and we haven't analyzed we didn't get enough data to analyze the blood blood samples for sex because the contaminants uh the the amount of blood you need to do the contaminants analysis is large but that's a really good question i you know i think my guess is that there's there's going to be some difference in the effect on males and females. En realidad, tenemos varias preguntas y eh, vamos a quedarnos respondiendo a las preguntas, pero vamos a cerrar la transmisión eh, en vivo en Facebook. Y nos vamos a quedar acá respondiendo las preguntas. Gracias a David. Y los que se quieran quedar, pues se pueden quedar y para continuar respondiendo a las preguntas que quedan. Eh, so, David, just so you know where we are talking. Um, we have several more questions. So right now we are going to end the live transmission, the streaming on Facebook. And um, we will continue with some of the questions for the people who, who would like to stay a little bit longer. Okay. okay, so how what what should I do to connect to Facebook or just stay no, where I am? Just just stay where you are. I will suggest okay. maybe if you see the little glove icon with the translation options, so you can move to the English channel, and that way okay. you also will hear Arturo while translating. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I think I can stop sharing my screen now. Okay, I think uh, Arturo, could you try to see if David can hear you now? David, can you hear me? David, David, can you hear me? No, I think, Hello. can you hear? Okay, we can keep doing this right now. I can translate some of the questions. No there in ¿En qué canal estás? Ah, bueno. I'm in English <laughs> and David, were you able to activate the translation option? No, I don't see where's the, I, I don't see the icon down there. I see, um, I have the chat and the participants, but I, uh, I have a, you know, I have that's, the three dots and it's, that just is breakout rooms. Okay, that's, that's fine. I think we can finish this last part as we were doing right now. Okay. Okay. I do see and, some of the questions in the chat as well. Yeah, though. exactly. Okay. Entonces la pregunta es de Irene. Pero no me está escuchando. Sorry, I couldn't hear. Okay. Did, did you hear the translation for that question, David? No, I did not. Okay. So they're asking about if there are any common uh, sickness or tumors or something that can be show, I mean, related with these contaminants. Um, what are the prevention actions that people can implement? Well, so uh, lots of times animals that are exposed to high levels of different contaminants show uh, um, a lack of energy. Uh, they may have uh, poor balance, difficulty walking. So because of their, it, the, some of these ca uh, contaminants will affect muscles and uh, nerve transmission. And so you'll see stumbling or inability to stand upright but there's often really nothing you can do. At that point, when, a, when an animal is showing that kind of response to exposure, I think it's already beyond the ability of anyone to do something about it because it's obviously affecting organs and, t and nerve tissue. I think it's beyond what you can do. Um, and, and that's unfortunate, but that's, it's, this is the case. When, when symptoms start to, start to become obvious, to us, it's usually when it's too late. 
Yeah. Okay, the next question is in English. It says, in the same way that you show in the short bridge which heavy metal are in this short bridge species, is it possible is possible working some regulations to obligate or I guess like press the shrimp companies uh, to show which contaminants or heavy metals are in the shrimps? In this way, the consumers can decide which products uh, they want to consume. So I guess it's more focused on is there any way to to work on regulations or to press the companies to identify contaminants on shrimps and make sure they communicate that with the customers. I, yeah. mm -hmm. Well, I think that, I mean, that's beyond the scope of what I do, but I think this is what consumers should be demanding in, in, in the products that they buy. And it's not often the case. And it's, this is not exclusive to shrimp. It's a, it's a problem with all the foods that we consume. Do we know what kind of fertilizers or what kind of pesticides or herbicides are used to control weeds and insects and other things that 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 are you know used on the foods that we eat? And so, you know, it's it's government regulations that would would then have to to play a role in one requiring that that um, that uh, producers can demonstrate the uh, you know um, low levels of any contaminants you know not only heavy metals not not only used in shrimp aquaculture and you know I, I know that that in that the export of shrimp is often affected by the by the um, by the presence of disease that the shrimps have, the shrimp have, like white spot or other kinds of disease, and and they, you know, countries that import shrimp, like in the EU, they will reject shrimp that are that are have been exposed to disease or or there's a history of disease exposure, which is the problem that the Brazilian producers were facing. So I think it's up to us as consumers to demand, you know, demand uh, more transparency. And then I think it, it does require us working with the industry and the producers to, to try and reduce the, the kinds of chemicals that are being used, whether or not they showed up in, and, and there's a whole family of chemicals that we didn't analyze yet. And those are organic compounds, not heavy metals that are used, you know, you know, fertilizers and antibiotics and a, number, a whole whole list of different products that are used in shrimp aquaculture. Um, you know, I think we have to work with the producers. The, 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 I think for me, the, the, there's, it's, a, it's sort of a spectrum because we know that there are many, many, there's a lot of small producers and there it's more difficult for them to meet the, the sort of the standards that say, you know, best aquaculture practices that, you know, the, the different uh, organizations that are certifying, you know, best practices in aquaculture. You know, it's hard for those small producers to really qualify to do that. And they, they and it's a matter of financial support to, to do that. Um, but in the, in the larger producers, then those are the conversations we need to have uh, to ensure that that they can they minimize the the use of chemicals and again it's not only about the, the the shorebirds that are using some these sites for any number of different activities it's the whole ecosystems that surround that so think about fish populations and invertebrate populations and and you know in the in in the situation in Ikapui you know the effluent coming from these shrimp ponds are going right out onto the Banco de Cajuai and it's not only affecting shorebirds there, but it affects a whole ecosystem. I think we have two more questions. Uh, thanks for the presentation, says Daniel Paludo. Can you measure how much important are, sh are shrimp farm in Icapui to shorebirds as an habitat? The Banco dos Cajuais is much more significant, doesn't it? I see. I see. My friend Daniele asked this question. So thanks for the question, Daniele. Um, 
So I think, of course, the, we we understand that the Banco de Cajuai is a is a an important site for shorebirds, and and certainly for species like red knot and even to some degree short-billed dowager, limnodromus species. This is a primary area for 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 them to feed during the migration and during the non-breeding period. Uh, and the shrimp farms are not that important. But when the tide, when when high tide comes and the birds are looking for a place to roost, many of them are coming to the shrimp ponds and salt and the salt ponds. And so this is where they they encounter uh, you know the potential exposure to chemicals. And you know, you'd like to say, hey, Semi-palmated sandpiper don't feed here. Find another place to feed, but they they feed there anyway, even during a period where you expect them to be roosting. But yes, I, I don't. I would never consider the shrimp ponds at Ikapui to be as important as the as the Banco de Cajuai, But the birds are using them, and so that puts them at risk if there are risks associated with the activities at the shrimp pond. I hope that I hope that answered your question, Daniele. Great. I think you could answer the question better than me. Okay, I think we have the last one. That's in Spanish. I'm gonna read it in Spanish just. So hay alternativas de productos que podrían usar las camaroneras que no tengan alto nivel de contaminantes para las aves. So the question is, is there any other alternative of products that the shrimp farming uh, industry could use that doesn't have that high level of contaminants? Well, that's a good question. And I think I mentioned this earlier. I don't have an answer to specifically, but I think there are, there is some discussion about how, how much those chemicals for whatever purpose it contributes to the, to the health and growth of shrimp. I mean, some of the some of the chemicals are used to kill the predators, so to kill the fish that may be in the ponds that are gonna eat the shrimp or kill other organisms that may be feeding on the same food that the shrimp are feeding on. Um, and so those chemicals are used. And some of them are, are you know, similar to the disinfectant that the, the cleaning agents that you would use in your own home. Um, so I just think it's um, a better understanding and and um, appreciation for what those chemicals could do in 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 the ecosystem at large, um, and you know, looking for alternatives and having that conversation is an important one. I don't have that. I don't. I don't know what those alternatives are necessarily. Yeah. Well. Tenemos la última pregunta. See, ¿Cómo one recomendaría more in the medir chat. estos contaminantes en las granjas camaroneras, las aves o también el hábitat, estanques, para que podamos controlar el nivel de contaminantes por debajo del nivel que está afectando a las aves? Okay, the question so is, I can read that. Exactly. You can I can read, read it. the Go question. <laughs> so, so that's a really good question. And, and I think this was one this was something that we wanted to do we wanted to really collect the invertebrates in the shrimp ponds and then look for contaminants in the invertebrates because that's the that's how you connect the dots you know from from what the birds are eating to why they're contaminated and then, then obviously the invertebrates are not moving they're, they're you know they're you know there's they're sedentary in, in the shrimp pond, at least. They're not moving into and out of the shrimp pond. So they're, whatever they're exposed to, they would be exposed to from act, what's happening in the shrimp pond. Uh, but we were never able to get uh, permission to collect invertebrates in the shrimp pond. So that's something that we're working on. Uh, we, we thought about using the water, but that seemed uh, difficult. To, um, so we, we, I, I would say if you have an opportunity to collect the collect invertebrates, 
I know some people have, have done that uh, to look at the 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 fauna that birds are are, are feeding on during their time in the shrimp ponds, and then if that if if it's possible to then then preserve those and do the analyses on those, then that would be uh, in addition to the blood the kinds of blood work that we did. Bueno, eh, pues muchísimas gracias por, por esta presentación. Yo quería hacer una última reflexión eh, que necesitamos entender un poco más. Mucho We de need to understand a little bit more in the case of Central America and the Equator. This has a lot of export products and they have a more control in the case of the market. And to be able to understand this is a lot more than what we saw in the presentation to understand a little bit more what we are supplying. There's a trend in Central America where in the case of, it is their production, it is now organic. And that implies all that chain of supplies as also being organic products to be able to compare all that connection and then how much is the influence of the environment i have a lot of questions with this presentation thank you david and also for that question the influence in the case of golfo de fonseca way over the area of the shrimp farms we have the peanuts the sugar cane so how much do those other crops have an influence and in the water that is being reused, everything ends up in the same place. So then we have a lot more questions and I hope we can work more closely with our shrimp farm industry. That is our goal, that we can sit at the table and identify the problems and find solutions. So thanks a lot, everybody and more than an hour, really. And we will continue with the next webinar that will be, we will know more about the experience of Mexico and the practices that have been identified as good practices in conservation of shorebirds. Juanita. Thanks everybody for being in this presentation in 15 days, a little bit before, we will send you an invite. I will be calling you about the experiences and the work we have been doing in Mexico. And we hope you can be with us again. And uh, we'd like to apologize for any inconvenience. Adios. Okay, thank you very much to everyone. Gracias, David. David. Gracias a todos. Thank you, thank David. You, David. Bye. Bye.